And it has been wonderful over these last few months to be able to have this Zoom contact. And one of our stalwarts has been uh, Admiral Ratif. We are very, very fortunate that we've got him as one of our members. He is so supportive. And of course, it's wonderful that we got him on hand to share his experience and insights with us. Uh, you know that um, uh, he retired as the head of the South African Navy. He's, he worked in uh, naval detachments all over the world, America, Britain, Israel, and he br brings all this insight and background and experience to us. Johannes wonderlijk dat jy so gewillig is om om jou kennis met ons te deel. Dat is werkelijk vir ons besondere voorweg. So, um, over to you, uh, our favorite Admiral, Johan. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being prepared to do these interesting talks for us. We've had several and it's been wonderful. Thank you, Letitia. Um, when I started preparing this, it was done under, um, based on a request by Dr. Phil Harris-Jones, who said, we'd like to know more about anti-submarine warfare. And uh, many years ago, nearly 50, 60 years ago, I attended the anti-submarine warfare course of the Royal Navy at HMS Vernon and found it a very, very interesting time of my life. I uh, found the Second World War and the world of anti-submarine warfare most interesting. Uh, when I started preparing this talk, I found that it's a lot more complex than I thought it would be. So if I leave bits and pieces out that you know of, uh, I already ask your pardon. It wasn't meant for any reason. Um, the time frame of the Battle of the Atlantic, or the submarine warfare, is given on this slide. 3 September 1939, Britain and France declared war on Germany. On 3 September 1939, after the declaration of war, the SS Athena became the first ship to be sunk by a submarine, U-30, in the western approaches northwest of Ireland. 117 passengers uh, were lost. <coughs> And the other end of the square, on the 7th May 1945, the submarine U-2336 sank two merchant ships, uh, the last ships to be sunk in World War II. They were the ship Avondale and Sneeland One, both were sunk in the Firth of Fort. The captain of 2336 claimed that he did not receive Admiral Karl Dunitz, who was current Admiral and uh, leader of the Nazi party at the time, he did not receive his fire order. On 7 May 1945, same day, Alfred Jodl, German Chief of Operations Staff, signed an unconditional act of military surrender and ceasefire. So, from day one, to the last of the war, the submarines were involved in the war. The strategies of the two countries concerned, the Britain declared a naval blockade the next day after the declaration of war, a naval blockade aimed against Germany. And Germany immediately declared a counter blockade against Allied and specifically Great Britain. Being an island nation, the British supply routes were particularly vulnerable. The forces opposing one another consisted of warships, commerce raiders, and submarines, supported by aircraft of the Luftwaffe, as well as by Italian submarines. The surface component of the German Navy was rapidly neutralized due to losses and the much cheaper U-boat became the main hunter. You can remember ships like Graf Spray, Charnos, uh, Bismarck, all meeting their end in 1940-1941. The 
the Allied forces on their side had mainly Royal Navy, Canadian Navy, and then later, of course, after the United States declared war on Germany, the ships and uh, aircraft of the various components. The arena, given by the slide from the book that illustrated the history of the Royal Navy. On this side, you have Britain. On that side, you have United States and Canada. The main supply route crossed the North Atlantic Ocean north of Ireland, known as the Western Approaches, this area, and also routes to Russia, to the Mediterranean, and Crete, and northwards to Russia, around Iceland. The slide shows also that aircraft based in Iceland and Ireland and Britain and in Canada could cover most of the area, but left an important gap in the center known as the North Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic Air Gap. At the time of the, uh, after the occupation of France, Germany shifted their submarine force to the western side of France and also to Norway, which meant they were a lot closer to the area that they wanted to control. Britain immediately instituted a convoy system to protect merchant ships. This concept was not new. It was used in the First World War, and it was based on the fact that it is easier to protect a large group of ships sailing together than to protect ships sailing singly. In this case, convoys were protected by escort vessels that went with them and by aircraft that worked with the escort vessels and working on them. Here on the left, you see an area where a convoy of ships is being gathered together to prepare for sailing. And on the right, you have a typical convoy formation. This formation is moving in that direction, and it is so organized that your most valuable cargoes are in the center, and the less valuable cargoes are on the wings. Ships, escort vessels, are arranged around the convoy in an arc known as a screen, and they, in fact, uh, move around searching for submarines. A little bit about the submarines in World War II. The Type 7, first one there, uh, was, and in fact, it came in a, in a number of types, A, B, C, and D. Uh, type 7C was the major one. 703 were, in fact, completed and participated. They were relatively small, 760 tons, 67 meters long, the surface speed was 70 knots maximum, submerged speed only 7 knots. They had a range of 8,500 nautical miles, 5 torpedo tubes, and, 80, and an 88 millimeter gun. This submarine, in fact, as a standard method of attack in the first part of the war, carried out most of the attacks on the surface. Admiral Donitz, who was the chief of the submarine force, was a submarine commander in World War I, and he also commanded torpedo boats thereafter. His employment of the submarines on the surface was rather similar to uh, that of a torpedo boat, and the submarine's hull 
was specifically shaped to travel at a very high speed on the surface, but with a very low uh, top hamper, and it was very difficult to see. Type 7 was followed by the Type 9 submarine, uh, which was actually basically the same submarine, but somewhat larger. Uh, it was 1,100 tons, 76 meters long, 17 knots and 7 knots above and below the water. It had a range of 10,500 nautical miles, and it had five torpedo, six torpedo tubes and 88 millimeter gun. Type 9 was used extensively in the early part of 1942 after the United States joined the war. They were sent off to the east coast of the uh, United States in an operation called Operation Drumbeat. And they started their war against the shipping on the East Coast early in January 1942. They were extremely successful, basically because the Americans did not believe in the convoy system and sailed their ships individually. Not only that, they kept the coastline on the East Coast well lit up at night, which meant that the submarines who was to, were to seaward could see the ships clearly, and the ships who had the lights behind them could not see the submarines to seaward. They were easy targets, like shooting fish in a barrel, I think is the word. Um, but soon during 1940, had a most successful time and sank many, many uh, Allied ships. It was known as the first happy time. The period of time in early in 1942, when the Type 9s deployed off the East Coast, was known as the second happy time. The next submarine we come to is the Type 14, this one over here. It's a uh, the only thing we built, they were resupplenishment submarines in German milk cow or English milk cows, 1900 tons, 67 meters long, and they had a 12,000 nautical mile range. Their job was to meet up with submarines in the middle of the Atlantic and to provide them with bottles and fuel. The fourth class we come to is the Type 21. It was known as the Electro Bird. It was built late in the war. Only 118 were completed. It was a large shop, 1,800 tons, 76 meters long. But it had a very large battery and could sail a long distance underwater. Its surface speed was 15.6 knots maximum, but its underwater speed was more than 17 knots. The whole shape was vastly different to that of the first three types. The uh, hull of the Type 21 was much more designed like a modern submarine today. The electro boat, only two of them were ever really deployed, and none of them sank any ships before the war ended. The Type 23, of which 63 was built, was a small version of the Type 21. Um, it was small, between 250 tons, 35 meters long. It also had a higher submerged speed and a surface speed, but a short range. They were actually built for the Black Sea and for the Eastern Mediterranean. And one of the demands by Dennis was that this submarine must be small enough to be transported by rail to the operating areas. 
They only had two torpedo tubes. This is a Type 70 submarine that's in the submarine museum at Kiel in Germany. Um, here, it has not been fitted with a deck gun, but the submarine is complete as it is. It has been so arranged that you have a door in the front and stairway so that visitors can walk through and can see the submarine easily. We also have a submarine in our, our museum in Simonstown, but it's not arranged like this. But here you can clearly see the Type 7 hull is shaped like that of a small, fast and surface ship. Torpedoes. Let's talk quickly about torpedoes because eventually that's the business end of the submarine. The first torpedo that was deployed is the G7A which was a wet heater torpedo. Now, a wet heater is a very strange system. It was designed in the late First World War, and it lasted to right in the beginning of the Second World War. It was also used by other navies. It's, in fact, a steam-driven to uh, torpedo, where liquid, uh, compressed air and fuel is pumped into a combustion chamber combusts and then water is sprayed in to form superheated steam. The steam drives at a reciprocating four cylinder engine or in some cases a steam turbine. In this case it was a four cylinder engine. It is 21 inches in diameter and here we use imperial management uh, measurement because somehow when you talk torpedoes we talk inches. 23.5 feet long in the nose, over here, it had about 300 kilograms of explosive, and it was fitted with a pistol that had both a contact and a magnetic function. The speed could be set 30 knots for 12,000 yards, 40 knots for 8,000 yards. It was quite fast, and it was a straight runner. By setting the this, this running depth and deep, the idea was to, that the torpedo would pass through underneath the ship and the pistol would fire, be fired by the magnetic signature of the ship. The magnetic pistol did not work well at all. In fact, Admiral Donut was quoted as saying that never before as a nation entered a war was such a useless weapon. My apologies. The Type G7E torpedo is it over here, was the same size. It had a lead acid battery and an electric motor. It was decidedly slower than the um, G7A. Speed of 30 knots, 8,000 yards. Now, one of the problems you had with the G7A was that it was extremely noisy, and the ship could hear it on their sonars. The G7E did not make a noise. G7A also left a very clear bubble trail on the surface. Um, five versions of the G70 was produced. The last two were acoustic homing torpedoes. They had a search pattern at the end of their run, and then they would start searching for the noise of a ship. The rule was the submarine would stop its engines and go quiet before they fired this torpedo because they did not want the torpedo to home on their own engines. It was known as a NAT for German Naval Acoustic Torpedo. Eventually, the Allies devised a device called a Foxter, which was towed by the ship and made a noise in the water, either electrically or mechanically. And its function was to attract NATs. 
German patrol aircraft and bombers, it's important because the very long range Condor photograph you see here worked with the submarines. And in fact, when it detected the sub, uh, convoy, would shadow the convoy and report its position to the submarine headquarters, who then sent the message to the submarines and ordered them to form a wolf pack and to attack the convoy based on the convoy's position. The uh, important thing about the condor was that it had a range of 2,000 nautical miles and a fairly slow speed, but a fairly slow speed. It also carried bombs, both internally and on under wing racks. British resources, by the end of 1940, permanent convoys groups were established to work with the convoys. It was important to have a permanent group of ships who could learn together, maneuver together, and get to know one another. In fact, the British established a school at Tobermory where the ships went to work up as a team. Right in, in 1940, the Britain had too few warships and what they had were committed somewhere else. So they obtained 50 World War I United States Navy destroyers from the States. And these were the first uh, escorts for the convoys. In 1939, they also commenced a building program for large numbers of flower corvettes. They in fact built 294. And together with Canada, these were built uh, easily because they were very simple ships based on whale catchers and they were quite small. One engine, one uh, steam plant, they were fitted with a gun and depth charges. In 1939, they also started building the Black Swan class of ASW sloops, of which they built 37. This was a very much a specialized anti-submarine warfare ship, but was well fitted out with guns as well. And they were used as convoy escorts, but also as support groups where a group of ships worked together and were in fact allocated to a convoy. In 1940, they commenced building the river class ASW frigate of which they built 151. This was quite a nice ship. Uh, it is considerably larger than the uh, uh, sloops. And it was designed to carry uh, a weapon system called Hedgehog. And we'll come back to Hedgehog. 1943, they commenced building rock class frigates of which they built 28. In fact, the South African Navy received three of these uh, Loch Glass frigates. They were known to us as SS Natal, Good Hope, and Transvaal. One of them, in fact, sank a submarine. In 1943, they commenced building the Bay Class frigates, which was based on the Loch Glass, but was in fact more of an anti air warfare ship, the Boat 26. Just to recap on weapon systems, the river class was fitted with hedgehog only, the lock class was fitted with depth charges and squid, and I'll come to these things, and the others were fitted with depth charges only. The problem of attacking a submarine. A surface submarine is attacked with gunfire. Uh, and you try to puncture the hull, and thereby convincing it not to dive again or by rapping. Although the Admiralty did not really like people ramming the submarines with warships, because the damage to the warships were extreme. Uh, in one case, even the ship sank. A dive submarine is attacked by underwater weapons, which are directed by sonar. On this lower diagram, you have 
a picture of the ship. On its stern, it has depth charge rails. Below it, it has a sonar dome with a sonar transducer inside. The transducer is like a searchlight, but it transmits a sound beam uh, into the water. In the Second World War, the maximum range was somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 yards. And the speed of sound in water is about 1,100 yards per second. So for a pulse to go out to the, the maximum range and to come back took about six seconds. If a submarine enters the beam, here you can see a submarine, <clears throat> it becomes a very good reflector of sound. In fact, air in water is a very good reflector of sound. And of course, the submarine is filled with air. Once the pulse hits it, it goes back and it's detected by the submarine. In the case of the charges, the system worked on the process that the submarine had to pass, the ship had to pass over the submarine and drop its depth charges in a pattern around the submarine. <clears throat> this was distinctly easier said than done. The problem is that you have to pass over the submarine to lay a pattern. The submarine dies and the ship loses contact on the in sonar as the submarine goes deeper and it becomes closer to the ship. The ship had no way of determining the depth of the submarine. So it had to guess at it and had to set the depth on the depth charge in accordingly. This depth setting was done in 50 feet steps up to about 700 feet. And you know that if the you were close to the submarine, it was going to be shallow. And if you were farther away, he was going to dive to a deeper depth. The submarine, once you've lost contact with him, alters course and speed violently, and also dives or rises accordingly. So, how was the pattern of depth charges laid? The ship over here is traveling in that direction. As it travels, you drop a depth charge of its rails, another one, and it fires two depth charges from its depth charge throwers. And then it drops the final depth charge. This is kind of arranged in a rectangle with one charge in the center. Gert en Letitia, ek het een beetje van een spraakprobleem. So, aanvaard het maar vir die oomlik. The depth charge had to actually explode quite close to the submarine and to really damage it catastrophically. A range of about 20 feet was required. So many depth charges must the submarine. In fact, post-war, Statistics indicated that up to 80 depth charges were required to sink a submarine. Here you see uh, some depth charges, depth charges in a depth charge rail. <clears throat> and these are American depth charges. You can see they are tear shaped, but they're in a cage so they can roll in the rail. These are British depth charges being hoisted on a depth charge thrower. This is the thrower. It shot a depth charge sideways from the ship and uh, at the range of about 60 feet where it sinks. The depth charge has a hollow tunnel on the inside in which is situated the pistol and the primer which ignites the main charge. Uh, approximate weight of a depth charge is 300 pounds of explosive, normally amateur, and uh, it was a very um, inaccurate weapon. Very soon it was replaced by a 
a weapon called the hedgehog. And here you see the hedgehog mounting with 24 bomblets arranged on it. This was based on a spigot motor where a pipe which was pushed into the back of the uh, tube of the water bomb, and it was fired with an impulse cartridge. The gentleman at the back operated the firing circuit by swinging a little handle, firing one bomb at a time. The 24 bombs are fired ahead of the ship. Come on. Ahead of the ship, about 250 yards. And here you can see they fall in a circle in the water. The hedgehog projectile is only about 15, 40 pounds, and it has a contact fuse. But because it has a contact fuse, the depth of the submarine is not affected. Uh, they do not explode unless they hit the submarine. So if you fire the hedgehogs and there was an explosion, count one for the good guys. That was the end of the submarine. Um, now, this was quite nice. The discharges left a heck of a lot of air in the water. And this made detection by a submarine very difficult. Afterwards, after the what has been disturbed. Hedgehog was followed by the squid. The squid, and this is one from a museum, was a motor mounting of three barrels. And here you can see them from the front. The mounting was brought flat and the bombs were pushed on a little rails with a trolley and pushed down the barrel. The motor bombs were fired ahead of the ship, and accurate depth setting was essential because each of these bombs, here's a diagram of a bomb, was fitted with a clockwork fuse that commenced the moment the bomb hit the water. And what you said was the time it had to run to get to the right depth. Squid was very accurate compared to the other systems. But of course, like the depth charges, all the squids exploded. Carrying out a squid attack, to retain sonar contact, the submarine approach, a deep beam was added to the system. And here is our ship. There is the, the beam that we saw previously. And they added another transducer sending a deeper but shorter beam into the water, specifically to hold contact with the deep submarine. Also, measurement of the depth was important. And they fitted another transducer called the sword, which you could move in an uh, angle. And it had a flat thin beam by which you could determine the angle of the submarine below the ship. And of course, if you have the angle and the distance, the depth was easy to calculate. The depth was sent electrically to the squid mounting and the fuses were set. And they have a clock mechanism that is triggered by the bomb. The pattern of six bombs are fired, three set 25 feet above the submarine's depth and three set 25 feet below the submarine's depth. And hopefully, this is what will happen. Let's talk about aids of finding a submarine. Radar was available early on in the war already, and most ships were fitted with uh, a surface warning radar. It was most important for convoy work. First, to find a convoy. Secondly, to avoid running into the convoy when you chase a submarine. And thirdly, to detect a submarine on the surface. The German tactics of submarines was that the moment the convoy was detected, 
But submarine detecting the convoy would keep on shadowing it and send a high frequency radio message home. So I found them, they are here. Headquarters then sent a message to all the submarines in the area saying the convoy is in this position. Please form a wolf pack and engage them. The shadowing submarine kept on sending updates and this was done on high frequency radio, which has a considerable, although high frequency work with sky wave mainly, it has a considerable surface wave component. And the ships were fitted with a direction finding system that could detect the surface wave in ranges of about 10 to 15 nautical miles. So if you get a detection from a submarine, gives you a direction as well as a possible range. The rule was then to chase down the bearing and try and force the submarine down and in fact to attack it. Code breaking, you all know about code the ultra system at Blinsley Park where submarine codes amongst others were broken. And of course when a submarine sent their messages, this was intercepted at Blitzley Park and they broke the codes and managed to pass on to the um, Maritime Operations Center the messages of the submarines. A very, very important component was the Maritime Patrol Aircraft uh, from Coastal Command of the Royal Air Force. And I'll get back to Coastal Command again. The ships, some of them convoys carried what was known as catapult aircraft merchantmen. It was a merchant ship fitted with a catapult on its barrel and normally a hurricane aircraft fitted on top of the uh, catapult. This catapult and aircraft were normally deployed to chase away the Condor long range aircraft tracking the convoy. Um, I can find only about 12 occasions that it was used. The Hurricane could not land. The pilot had to jump out and was in fact recovered by the ships of the fleet. Um, of the 12 times that it was fired, I think 11 or more times the convoy was shot, the condor was shot down or chased away, and only one pilot was lost during that time. Another ship that was designed was the merchant aircraft carriers. These were large ships, normally grain carriers or tankers, fitted with a flat fly deck, and they carried swordfish aircraft with which to scout and in fact uh, attack submarines. As far as I can determine, none of the Mac ships ever sank a submarine. But on the other side, none of the Mac uh, convoys that had Mac ships deployed with them suffered any casualties because they managed to patrol the area quite effective. The next ship that came on the scene was the American Carrier Vessel Escort. This is quite a long story because it was a gentleman called Kaiser who built ships, who said he in America could build small ships, small carriers quickly, which he did. Uh, 87 of them went to the United States, 37 went to Britain. They were known as uh, jeep carriers or carrier vessels escort. The sailors also called the CVEs as being combustible, vulnerable, and expendable. But five of the CVEs were deployed in the Atlantic as hunter.
five of the United States carriers were deployed as artillery groups in the Atlantic uh, under American command. They sank quite a number of submarines, I think something like 15, and managed to capture one U-505 uh, by uh, the carrier vessel Guadalcanal that, and its destroyers. This was quite an issue because the Admiralty was very much afraid that the Germans would find out about the capture and that the Enigma coding machine was now in Allied hands. And they were afraid that the codes may be changed. This did not happen. And in fact, the, uh, um, it only became known to the Germans after the war. Uh, there you go. Once again, let's look at the arena. With the shift of the occupation of France, U-boat bases were shifted to harbors and like Bordeaux, Brest, Lorient, La Rochelle, and Saint-Nazaire. Here is a um, picture of the U-boat pens in Brest, and they were built in all those harbors. The U-boats could actually enter these uh, pens, and they would be safe against Allied air attack. The British did not have bombs big or mean enough to fracture the U-boat pins. Um, Admiral Donitz also shifted his headquarters to L'Oreal. Now, with the submarines deployed in this area, they were a lot closer to their target area than in the days when they failed sailed from Germany. Also, German Aircraft would affect propellers. Now we get to Royal Air Force Coastal Command. Their tasks protect Allied shipping against air attack, protect Allied shipping against submarine attack, and interdict enemy shipping. <coughs> they had quite an They had quite a range of aircraft, and yeah, the picture I have is that of a de Havilland Mosquito, with a 57 millimeter gun to be used against submarines. Coastal Command flew from bases in Britain, Ireland, and Iceland. <coughs> Their aircraft included fighters, fighter bombers, light and medium bombers, and heavy bombers and anti-submarine patrol aircraft and very long-range aircraft. They deployed airborne anti-surface vessel radars, ASV Mark 1 and Mark 2, which was a 1.5 meter wavelength radar. They later were fitted with ASV Mark 3, which was a very short wave radar, 10 centimeters, and the Mark 7, which was an even shorter wavelength Mark uh, of three centimeters. The AS3, ISV Mark III and Mark VII was important because they could detect the submarine at snorting depth, which the ISV Mark I could not do. In support of the ra uh, radars, the ships, the aircraft were fitted with a Lee light named after one wing commander Lee who then it out. And we'll get back to the Lee light. Weapons included standard bombs, rockets, machine guns, airdrop depth charges, and the Mark 24 mine. The Mark 24 mine was not a mine, it was a torpedo, but because of security reasons, they named it a mine. Coastal Command was most successful. They sunk 360 German transport vessels and damaged 134 uh, of them. They also destroyed 212 U-boats, which was more than anybody else. So, uh, a maritime air force is a problematic. If it's managed by the air force, 
they become the Cinderella servants. Air Force will buy bombers and fighters long before they buy maritime aircraft. And Britain had the same problem in those days. Today, we have the same problem in our country. Here are some of the ship aircraft. This is the Wellington medium bomber. In its nose, in its nose, you can see the dome of the ASV-3 radar. And there's another dome at the back, in this case fitted with a lead light. On another aircraft, there's a lead light fitted under the wing. Now, the important thing with the lead light was that at night, the aircraft would detect the submarine on the surface on radar. It was very difficult to attack on radar because the ground wave of the radar was such that you, you lose contact if you get too close. So to solve this problem, they would go towards the submarine and the moment they lost contact, they would switch on the lee light pointing it at the submarine. And it was a 24-inch search light, I think, in that case. It immediately lit up the submarine, and you could carry out a very accurate attack. Other patrol aircraft, of which we know, of course, is Sunderland, which our Air Force also flew. The American Catalina, uh, or patrol bomber, which was also flown, and in fact, that used the bottom of flight as one of its landing areas. And then a very important aircraft, the B-24 Liberator. The Liberator was the most constructed bomber in the Second World War. It had the ability of a very long range. And it was fitted with radar and carried out the ability carry out patrols well over the air gap. Weapons used was the airdrop depth charge, 200 pound depth charge, with a very shallow setting. The aircraft, when it attacked the submarine, the submarine was normally in the process of diving to get away. So this was set somewhere between 20 and 30 feet, and it's most successful. And here you see an attack on the left by a Sunderland aircraft, dropping the, sub, the bomb right close to the submarine. On the right is the Mark 24 mine, which was in fact an airdrop acoustic torpedo. Uh, because it followed the ship rather like a dog follows its owner, it was also nicknamed Fido. It had a very small void, but it had a contact fuse. So it followed the submarine, hit it, and exploded and punched the hole in the pressure hole. It was most successful. When we get to the final scorecard, during this war and this battle, 3,500 Allied merchant ships and 175 Allied warships were sunk. 783 U-boats and 40 German warships were lost. More than 100 convoy battles were fought. And more than 1,000 single ship encounters took place. Churchill later wrote in his memoirs that the only thing that really frightened me was the U-boat peril. I was even more anxious about this battle than I had been about the glorious Air Force called, air fight called the Battle of Britain. Okay, and that brings us to the end of the story. Uh, here you see a G7A torpedo leaving a trail on the surface and hitting, hitting its target right where it hurts the most in the engine room. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Johan. Anybody who wishes to raise an issue, please open your microphone or raise the electronic hand and I'll recognize it. Anybody? Uh, Johan, can uh, I ask here. something? 
Sorry, go ahead. Go on. Uh, um, what, I, what I want to know, uh, sorry, I'm just, um, I can't understand the sonar. The sonar of the destroyers were forward facing, it seems. They couldn't direct it towards the side. But if you were a, a, a captain of a submarine, surely you would attack a convoy from the side because you'd have a bigger target uh, rather than the front. So that I can't understand that. And the other thing was the subs had a way of releasing air to fool the sonar. Could you um, comment on that, please, Johan? Of That's course. Good. No, the, the submarine, the Chevron sonar, and I think you have the diagram on your screen at the moment. Um, was like a searchlight, you could train it and round all around the ship. But that third sonar did not have the ability to elevate or depress the beam. But it was fully rotatable in any direction. So you could maintain contact even if the submarine was on your beam. Uh, that is the first point. The second point is, yes, the submarines had called something called an SBT, a sonar bubble target, which was a canister filled with um, chemicals. At the moment it was released through a tube in the submarine, created a large target of bubbles in the water, which could reflect the sound, sound wave back, sound pulse back to the target ship. Okay. So to re recap, the sonar you see here can be aimed in any direction. The problem is you sail forward and you drop the charges of the back of the ship. So you have to bring the sonar and submarine onto your bow. And ships could fit it with an indicator in the wheelhouse above the wheel called the steer by sonar indicator. The moment you were in contact, there was a pointer pointing out the relative direction of the submarine. And you gave the order steer by sonar, and the man on the wheel, the quartermaster, would turn the ship to keep the submarine right on its front. Any other questions? You want, uh, Carol and I happened to visit Cape Point yesterday. And in the visitor center, it indicates that there were 12 German submarines that operated around the coast of South Africa. Were any of them found and, um, and damaged or not? As far as I know, one of them was found and sunk, but exactly where I don't know. Um, there may have been more, there may have been less. We had uh, radars fitted in that area, specifically to look for submarines. We also had uh, harbors like Cape Town and Saldana and underwater cable arrays, which detected the submarine's uh, magnetic field. And then there were mines that could be detonated in the area to attack it. But uh, exactly how many submarines were found off Cape Point? I do not know off the top of my head. And also can I ask you about the Pacific Ocean? Was the uh, strategy used by the Japanese very different from the Germans? And was uh, likewise the Allies, were their tactics different in the Pacific Ocean? No, the, uh, the Allies, <clears throat> you have to think of this from two directions, in the sense that the Americans, who, whose war was in the Pacific, um, used their submarines just like the Germans used their submarines against the British to carry out the blockade of the Japanese supply routes. Um, in fact, one of the defenses of Adam Dunitz at his post-war trial uh, I think Admiral Nimitz, Nimitz, the American Admiral, gave evidence that the American orders were similar to the German orders as far as submarine attacks and unrestricted submarine warfare was concerned. 
the um, Japanese ability to carry out a blockade of the Americans was much, much less than that of the Germans. The supply lines were longer, uh, the area was larger, and they used their submarines more in an attacking mode against surface warships than against supply ships. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question, Johan? Yes, please. Johan, that I read somewhere, if it's a myth or if it's true, that the people in Stres Bay used to supply diesel and Brandevain to the U-boat crews. Is that true or is that a myth? Uh, I think that's a myth. Um, whether a submarine could come into stress by and launch a, a boat to go to the shore, I have no doubt that it was possible. But whether it truly happened, I have my doubts. But uh, I, my parents had a holiday home in stress by, so I'm well aware of that story. And uh, but I have no proof there. That sounds like a sonar noise maker. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Johan. One more question about the local area. There's a there's a gun still uh, near Old Harbour in Hamanas. Uh, what was that put there for? Do you know? Uh, for commemorative purposes. So it, so it never had any practical application? I didn't think it did. No, it had no, it no, there was never a, a guns crew around it during the war. In fact, I don't think it was there during the war. Uh, what is normal after a war is that old guns are disposed of. Those that aren't cut up and melted and beaten into plowshares, in fact, I use for memorial purposes. But what is true is that the uh, the Catalina aircraft flew from um, Fisher Haven, where the yacht club is now built on the site of the Air Force base that supported the Catalinas. Good, Ray, 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 Robert. Yes, John. Yes, you have your hand up. Please go ahead, John. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to sort of make a comment from the other side. I was a, a boy in the UK when war broke out. I was eight years old. And um, through, the, through the war, the, the, the British had a ministry, ministry for food. And the man who occupied the position for most of the war was a businessman. He had in the 1920s and 1930s been, res been responsible for building up Lewis's into one, of the, I think, the biggest retail chain in, in Britain. He'd been en ennobled, but uh, and he was then Lord Woolton. He offered his services to the UK government, and after some time in an advisory capacity, a, a rather reluctant Churchill appointed him a businessman to uh, operate as the Minister for Food. And his task was to see that there war, the was adequate food in Britain through the war, and also he had responsibilities to the Commonwealth. And he introduced a, 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 he introduced rationing, and he did it uh, with advice from nutritionists as to what food was necessary in terms of protein and carbohydrates and fats, and also in terms of, of total calorific value. And he made sure that pregnant women, infants, and kids like me got uh, things like cod liver oil, and we got uh, lunches at, at school. And he, 
he had this uh, responsibility to make sure that the, the rations could be kept, given what was going on in the Atlantic with ships carrying uh, um, food and other, other supplies to, 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 uh, in, into Britain. Britain was less than 50% supportive of, of uh, in terms of food. And although that increased through the war with growing more vegetables on in back gardens and golf courses and goodness knows where, there was still a great uh, dependency on things like grain and sugar and other commodities. So his job was complicated by what happened to individual ships and convoys and how to keep supplies uh, at, a, at a reasonable level. The rations did vary through the war. I remember as a boy, the, the basic ration of chocolate was eight ounces a month, which wasn't exactly a, a, a large amount. But he did a, a wonderful job, Walton, Lord Walton, and he also made some uh, striking deals which a politician wouldn't have, wouldn't, probably wouldn't have, have been able to make with the Canadians and the Egyptians and goodness knows who. And so at the end of the war, he could say that the health of the British people was better than it had ever been, particularly in children. And you could also say that there were no obese people because the rationing system was adequate, but not more than adequate. And obesity has only come in subsequently with the opportunity we, that we have for uh, for um, choosing what we what we want to eat. But Wilton, who was an unsung hero, uh, was written up recently in a biography called Eggs and Anarchy. And I've forgotten the author's name, but Eggs and a Anarchy will certainly find it. And it, it was a fantastic career in which he made sure that the British people were fed through the war, given that the aim of the Germans was to starve the British into submission. Thank you. Thank you, John. Interesting story, Evans. Anybody else? Can I just come in and, and, and say to John, these uh, regulations uh, about food for children, I mean, I grew up in Zimbabwe, then Southern Rhodesia, and because British children were given, given cod liver oil and what have you in little bottles of milk, we all had that as well, even though we, we didn't suffer the kind, same kind of deprivations. It's something that went out throughout the Commonwealth, which is quite a touching little thing. Thank you, John. Thank you, uh, Johan. I enjoyed that tremendously. Thank you so much. Lovely that, that we've got an expert who can chat to us. Yeah, there's a lot. <clears throat> there's a lot more to say, but really, uh, I think it would just confuse the issue. I know regarding the food that there are there's allegations that at one stage Britain was down to one week's worth of food before the next convoy arrived, which could very possibly interesting, be amazing. Before I sign off, can I wish everybody a blessed Christmas season and travel safely. Well, before we sign off, any last questions? Anybody else? Maybe I'll ask, ask one quick question, Johan. How long can an, a U-boat operate independently before it has to be resupplied? That's a very, if you look at the Type 9 U-boats, they were designed for long, long periods away. And the, you could probably reach six weeks without fuel or food. Um, but traveling in a U-boat that's fully packed up with food is really difficult because really every single nook and cranny is stuffed with food. And uh, so six weeks, probably two months. If you go carefully, and feed slowly. Um, you have the problem that you may run out of 
torpedoes before you run out of fuel or food. And replenishing torpedoes at sea is very, very difficult. All right. Thank you. Nobody else? Johan, thank you very much. And as always, all the research that you do and the expertise that you are able to present to us, thank you very much. And thank you everybody who joined in this morning. We had a very nice compliment. I'm going to end the meeting now. Goodbye. Goodbye.